hit these pubs and clubs and stuff for a while. We actually got offered a gig at a fairly kind of posh place called the Big Quick Club. It was a nightclub, and we would just sit on a couple of bar stools and, and sing folk songs or take requests or anything we could do. It was the kind of place where the young, hip kind of actors and stuff of the day would turn up. People like, um, oh, well, I did find my actual membership card of the Quick Club, which I'm pr proud of. Sadly, it's no longer there, or the card might still work. Um, but people like Michael Caine would, would come, you know, who's, who was the, the hot new actor of the day. Um, David Hemmings, but if you guys remember David Hemmings from Blow Up, um, he was brilliant and amazing, great, and a great friend of mine. Uh, and Terence Stamp and his unbelievably beautiful girlfriend Jean Shrimpton. Um, it, was a, it was a cool place. And we would play, and one night we were sitting on barstools doing our set, and uh, after the show, uh, a man called Norman Newell came up to us and introduced himself. He was wearing a very shiny suit. He said, uh, have you boys ever made a record? And we said, no, we haven't. He said, would you like to come on an audition for EMI Records? And of course, we were thrilled to death. It was incredibly exciting for us. And uh, we said, we'd love to. And we went and did the audition. And uh, a few weeks later, we got a letter in the mail uh, offering us uh, a contract with EMI Records, which of course we jumped at. Um, the kind of song that, that we were doing at the time, the sort of song he actually signed us for, was a folk song. Uh, he particularly liked our version of this old folk song that I'm going to do for you now. I'll give you uh, a bit of it to give you an idea. Because of course we didn't, back, back then as I say, in the Pickwick Club, we couldn't uh, afford a fabulously handsome and incredibly expensive band such as we have on stage with us tonight. Uh, it was, it was, uh, when you got one, uh, um, so this is, this is the kind of song that they, they actually intended for us to be recording because they thought we were going to be sort of the English folk duo like Peter, Paul and Mary without Mary or whatever. And, and, and so this is our version of a, of a song uh, called 500 Miles, which you probably know. I learned it off the Joe Baez record, though I know there are several people recorded it, including Peter, Paul and Mary. And actually, a thrill later in, in, in our career, much later, was after Gordon and I got back together for a while um, after a 38 year gap. We were singing this on one of the very last shows we ever did together, and John Baez, from whom I learned it off our records, was in the audience by an amazing coincidence, came up and joined us on stage and sang it with us, which was, which was very exciting. And that's to say that was one of the last shows we did. So um, this is 500 Miles.
song which miraculously got us our record deal. We, we, we were all set, we did the audition, got the thing, signed the contract, ready to go. And Norman told us that he booked our first session, he'd hired some great musicians, they wanted us to do that song, a couple of Everly songs, uh, I forget what else. But he also said, look, if there's any songs that you know of or think of that you'd like to include in your first session, feel free. Now this is where fate takes a considerable hand in my, in my narration, as it does from time to time. Because I had at the time, and still have to this day, two very beautiful sisters by the name of Jane and Claire. And my sister Jane uh, was already quite well known as an actor. Claire was a school teacher, um, and Jane was, was doing well as, a, as an actress. And she was also very often on this uh, television show, Jukebox Jury, which some of you may know about, where they had various people on, and celebrities on, talking about the new releases. And Jane loved music. She was very musical herself. She plays the piano and is, reads music much better than I do. And and so she was uh, she was good when she was on jukebox tour, and she became sort of well known for her views on, on music. And thus it was that she was invited by the Radio Times, I think it was, to go down and see what she thought of this band with the funnily spelled name that all the fuss was being made about, and all the girls were screaming over. She, she had not seen them, and they'd just come down to London, and the Beatlemania was beginning. So she went down to see the show, she thought they were incredibly good, she met them all, she thought they were funny and charming and she liked them a lot, they all met her, they liked her a lot, one of them liked her in particular, asked her out, and so on. So thus it was that she ended up going out with Paul McCartney for whatever it was, two or three years or something. And, um, and yeah, there they are looking incredibly young, and, and so thus it was that uh, in the end, it, it meant that he was hanging around our house an awful lot. And when, when they weren't out on, on the road. So eventually our parents kind of took pity on Paul and offered him the guest room at the top of our house, which was next to my bedroom on the, on the top floor. So he ended up setting up in there as kind of a pied à terre when they weren't touring. He would be there. So he and I were sharing the top floor of the house, which was, which was great. You know, he and I became friends. We had a lot of interests in common. We both played the guitar, him much better than me. Uh, we both had record collections, his much more extensive than mine, so I suppose on ba on, in retrospect it must have been a somewhat, you know, uh, depressing experience. But, but uh, at the same time, of course, it was exciting because I got to hear him writing some of the songs that he was working on and so on. And during that time, uh, I had heard him sing this song, World Without Love, and I liked it. And he explained that it was a song that was not finished, he'd just written two verses, and um, had not finished the song because John made fun of it. Because John apparently, when Paul would sing the first line, please lock me away, John would apparently go, okay, I will, the song's over. Um, and he didn't think it was, a, it was a song that was right for the Beatles, it wasn't rock and roll enough. So Paul had basically just put it aside. So, and then a few months after that, we got our record deal and set our record date. So at that point, I went back to Paul and said, look, that song you played me a few months ago that was unfinished, you know, would you mind if we did it? Because we've got a contract, we've got a date, we'd, we'd make a real record, honestly. And, and he said, fine, you know, nobody else wants it, you can have it. And uh, so at that point he wrote out the, uh, the words and, and, uh, for me. Uh, that's the, the words and the, and the chords in his handwriting. Needless to say, the, the original of that is safely locked away in my safe at home. <laughs> so that when things go completely just shit, I can run to Sotheby's like the wind. <laughs> It always gets a great laugh, and of course it's completely true. But, um, He's an asher. Um, and at the same time, uh, one of the things Paul and I also had in common, we both had tape machines. I had a Ferrograph, as I recall. He had a Brunel, I think. And we would play around with backwards tapes and stuff. But anyway, we used my tape machine in my room at this point. I asked him if he would make a little demo for me of the melody of this song, so that I didn't screw up the melody. And, and he did. So here's the little demo Paul made for me of World Without Love.
That's not supposed to happen. Sorry about that. My back? Yes. Sorry. Um, anyway, so so uh, all I had to do then was prevail upon him to finish the song in time for our recording session, because I had no bridge, which he did. So finally, uh, I think it was only a week or so before the session, I said, please, I really want to do that song, but it really needs a bridge. He went into his bedroom with his guitar for an incredibly, annoyingly short amount of time, like 10 minutes, and came up with the, with the bridge written in red, probably, because it was an emergency. And, uh, and that's, that's, I wrote the chords in, so I couldn't possibly screw it up. Um, so on. So, and uh, that went on the list for our very first session. So my, the first day in the studio was, for me, incredibly exciting. I loved it. It all went very well. I knew right away that this was something I wanted to do. I loved the technology of it. I loved having great musicians that I could ask to play things same way I do now, and and uh, and they would actually do what I suggested. It was great. I realized that I really wanted to be a record producer once I understood what that job was. Uh, that, of course, at the time, as you, if any of you can see, it was state of the art. That was four tracks. That was as, as fancy as studios got, and I loved all that stuff. Gordon, on the other hand, was a bit less enthralled with the technological aspects of, of, of Gordon, but uh, but he sang so well that he made up for it. Anyway. Uh, the session went very well, but by the end of the session, all thoughts of us being folkies was kind of out the window. It was very clear that World Without Love was going to be our first single. It came out, uh, it went to number one in the UK, number one all over Europe, and eventually, and miraculously, went to number one in America, which was just about the most exciting news we could get. The only snag was actually that uh, I was at university at the time. I'd left Westminster at this point, and I was reading philosophy at King's London. So I had to go and see the Professor Vesey, the head of the philosophy department, and my tutor, to explain that this strange thing had happened. They really wanted to go to America to tour and do TV shows, and could I possibly get some time off? And he was very skeptical, uh, but eventually he did agree to grant me a one year's leave of absence to go get all this pop nonsense out of my system and come back and get my proper philosophy degree. Tragically, of course, to my shame and embarrassment, I have to admit, I'm still on that one year's <laughs> But you never know. I could go crawling back someday. Um, so we found ourselves, of course, part of a, of, of a British invasion, uh, along with a lot of other shows. What Without Love was actually the first US number one uh, of the British invasion after uh, after the Beatles, oh, after everyone hold your hand. But there were a lot of other people, and we would, and we were all doing. We'd meet up. We we're doing these TV shows because we would do TV shows in the UK. That's some great ones, bro, like Ready Steady Go. You probably know with the the lovely Kathy McGowan, uh, and that was a, it was a cool show to do because it was live. And and thank you, Lucky Stars, of course, with the legendary Brian Matthews, who is still with us to this day. Um, who was very cool, and and uh, those were fun. But of course, we really looked forward <coughs> very much to going to America and doing shows there. And there was, we didn't know many of the American shows, but there was one show that was so famous that even though we'd never seen it, we knew uh, that it was a big deal. And the minute we got on that show, we got really excited. So one of our American trips, we did this show. Here he is, Ed Sullivan. London youngsters who met while they were attending Westminster School and developed the top flight stars. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter and Gordon. Yeah.
The shows that were the most fun to do were the ones that were live. Like I said, Ready, Steady, Go was live. You actually got to sing, which was great. At Sullivan, you got to sing live. And there were several in America that were, that were cool. Uh, there was a famous one called Shindig in L.A. that we did a number of times, which was great. But actually, my favorite was a show called Hullabaloo, which was based in New York. And Hullabaloo, they would do this thing where they'd let you sing your hit, and then they'd take another hit from that era, another current hit, in this case a Beatles song, and, and they put a bunch of acts together, all singing it. So on, on one uh, episode of Hullabaloo, I remember getting to sing in the course of one song with uh, Diana Ross and the Supremes, and, exactly, and, and Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs, <laughs> and Frankie Avalon and a whole bunch of other people. Uh, and doing actually a Beatles song, so it couldn't be more relevant if it tried. And uh, it looked like this. Supremes because we loved everything that came out of Motown and they were the queens of Motown and Di Diana and I actually became friends and, and have worked together a lot ever since we were still friends to this day and have enjoyed making records together, something she refers to briefly in this little clip we have. A lot of people really help make a project come together. Conceptually, you start thinking of an idea, mm -hmm. and uh, I have a lot of really talented people that you have to bring to, it's a team of people that make things work. Mm -hmm. And uh, my muses, Peter Asher. Now to be fair, she does go ahead and mention a few other people. You know, but I think you, you haven't got time for that. <laughs> Let them get their own show. Um, so an another show we did, uh, we did a couple of shows by famous American comedians, some, some of whom you'll know, probably, but probably both. Um, one that was a bit startling, I'll tell you the story briefly, was our agents were all excited when we got the Jackie Gleason show. Does everybody know about Jackie Gleason here? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Because, you know, uh, he's, he's, in America, he's a comedy god. And since this time, I've, of course, watched every episode of The Honeymooners and recognized that he totally is a comedy god. But at the time, we'd never heard of him. And so our agents were, were so excited when they got us on the show. We went, oh, okay, he must be a big deal. So our disappointment when we walked on the set and there was this obnoxious, drunken asshole of a man <laughs> um, being incredibly unpleasant to everyone. Not to us, he didn't even acknowledge us at all. But to the crew and the cast, he was just horrible. 
I guess he owed that, right, by being a genius, but, but look out. Um, and then another one we did uh, was a guy called Red Skelton, another legendary American comedian who was not drunk and not an asshole. He was totally nice. But his producer, on the other hand, did have this idea. And at that point, we pretty, all pretty much did what we were told. And again, it, as well as singing the hit, they would ask you to take place in another number, take part in another number. And, and I do find myself sometimes involuntarily slowing down ever so slightly um, before inevitably int introducing you to a clip of what uh, the Red Skelton team asked us to do on their show. to do while we were in America, we got to do a whole bunch of, of tours. Uh, some of them were incredibly cool. We, we came across this poster actually just the other day, which I rescued, which is a pretty amazing bill when you think about it. Peter and Gordon, Tom Jones, the Shirelles, them, which, which is of course Van Morrison, Ronnie Dow, Mel Carter, Brian Hyland, Billy Joe Royal, pretty amazing. Uh, and we all had so much fun. We were all stuck on a bus together for weeks, you know, and uh, it was amazing. But even more miraculously, we were headlining because we, we'd had three hits. Tom Jones was on his first hit. It's not, it's not unusual. And uh, I, we, we became friends and we've been friends since too. But those, I mean, they don't make tours like that anymore. It was really fun being on the, on the road with so many different acts. Three dollars at the door. And th uh, three dollars, yeah, two dollars and fifty cents in advance, three dollars at the door. <laughs> Pretty cool. Um, for that, for all those acts. And, um, but of course we had to get back to uh, England from time to time in the midst of all this fun because we had to record more records. We, you know, World of Love had been a big hit, so our first trip back to England from America was to record our second single. Now, Paul had written this song promptly. People go, how did you get so many songs out of the Beatles? It didn't take any, any getting at all. The tradition of songwriting and song publishing is if you have a big hit, you make damn sure you write the follow-up as well. You don't want somebody selling records on your coattails. So when we came back to England, Paul had this song written completely ready for us to record. We loved it and we recorded it straight away, called Nobody I Know. One, two, three. Nobody I know can love me more than you. You can give me so much love. Thank you. 
I know I love you more than